Hi, my name is Jim Moyle and welcome to episode 3 of my PowerShell and Pester series. Um, the sharp eye of you will notice that uh, VS Code has a new theme. The purpose of this is uh, to help colorblind uh, people uh, with the, uh, the colors on, uh, on display, um, particularly for red-green. If you are colorblind red-green and this doesn't work for you, uh, let me know. Uh, Color blindness does affect 8% of all men, and according to my YouTube stats, that's the only demographic that watches any of my videos. So we'll try and accommodate that. Um, on the subject of colors, um, the breakpoint colors, we'll have to use breakpoints in this uh, episode, um, is uh, yellow, which may be a little difficult to see. If you do know how to change the breakpoint color in VS Code without editing the CSS, then let me know in the, uh, in the comments. So we've got a couple of files here, um, created by new fixture as we as we saw previously. Um, it gives us an empty function, uh, which we're uh, going to leave as it is. And <clears throat> the one we're going to particularly concentrate on is this .test.ps1 file. And as previously mentioned, we can have a lot of um, it tests inside the uh, the um, test.ps1 file. And the particular thing we're going to concentrate on is the should assertions, which is you're expecting one result, which is it should be something, and you're going to compare it to the result you are getting. There's a whole lot of comparison assertions that uh, we're going to look at. We're going to go through them all one by one, and uh, we're going to see what we think of them. So if we start off, then we've got the uh, three lines that are set up by new fixture. We talked about the here and the soot variables, and effectively it's just dot sourcing that empty function. We're going to leave that in there. We don't need the function, but uh, it doesn't matter. Now, should is just a PowerShell function, and if you thought that you could then do the normal get help um, on should, then apparently this isn't going to work because it's coded a strange way. So let's have a look what happens when you do get help and should. Well, you get a whole lot of strange things. You don't get the um, uh, parameter values that uh, you would expect. So unfortunately, um, you can't uh, look in help for that. Now then, uh, VS Code just crashed on me there, so I've just reopened it. Um, if you want help about should, then I would go to uh, the uh, Pesto wiki, which um, you can have a look at. And there's also some uh, about topics right there. Good. So let's jump back into the code. And we can see that we've got a describe block here. And the describe block contains all of the individual tests. Um, just a couple of words on, on syntax first. Um, the old formatting uh, in pre pester 4.0, there you don't have the traditional um, dashes before parameters. Um, post 4.0, you do. Now, the old structure still works in 4.0, but remember, without upgrading from the natively installed pester, which is at 3.4, it won't work. Um, so I'd encourage you to use the new format and make sure your, your pester is, is upgraded. So if we just F10 on that, then we can see that we have a um, past test that shows us the, the old syntax is still working. There's a couple of things that work on every single test. And the first one is the ability to negate anything. So you can always add dash not to any test to reverse it. So here we've got on line 33, true should be true. And seeing as those both are um, equal, we should pass that test. Good, and we can see below that that, that test has now been passed. We can also see that we're doing the exact same test, which is uh, true should not be false. And we can do that 
and again we can see below that we've passed that test. The other parameter which is um, available to every single uh, assertion or test is um, you can add a because line. Now because lines will give you extra information if that test fails and you it just takes a, a normal text string and if we have a look at that so false should be true that's going to fail and then in the test fails test result we'll see that we get a bit more detail so if somebody else is running your test and <clears throat> it may not be clear to them exactly what's happening then you can add and we can see this below the um, because line and then um, false should be true because honesty is the best policy all right so not and because parameters available for every test so let's get on to the individual assertions here so we're just going to set actual being um, a normal uh, text string called actual value and uh, let's just do that and now we can see the individual test so we're having a look to see if the uh, string within actual matches um, what we've got at the end of the, the should be and if we have a look at that great the test has passed brilliant stuff so <clears throat> if we take a different string compare it to what's in the variable and we'll just step past that and now we can see that we've failed and interestingly we can see below and the test will fail <coughs> we can have a much better look at this failure so it expected the strings to be the same and first off it's just checking for the length of the string we can see that the length of the strings are not equal and it also gives you an interesting uh, expected but was which can really help you in troubleshooting um, what the problem is inside your code so if you've got a function that spits out an object and you think that uh, when you pass that function the correct parameters the object at the end should be a certain value then you need to compare it here great for making sure that you are getting the expected output from your individual function good stuff if we have a look at the next test so this is B exactly and effectively this will add case comparison so it will in the previous should be it you know we can see um, that effectively the actual value is a capital A and we're checking for for a lowercase a and we still passed here we're looking and we compare it to the capital A and it will again pass and will fail uh, the, the not uh, the other one. So that's how to compare case as well in terms of uh, should be. Next one is should be greater than. Now this seems perfectly sensible so if we have a look at uh, the error count, we know error count is going to be get greater than one because we've just caused an error, which we can see in the uh, terminal below. And if we F turn on that, yes, we know that our error count is greater than zero. Now, a lot of these assertions, although they use a slightly different syntax than uh, the normal PowerShell operators, they're actually using the PowerShell operators that we know and love underneath. Now, PowerShell operators will do a lot more than compare straight integers. So you could actually compare two strings. So Peter greater than Paul, etc. So we'll just go through these and then in this case we can do some highlighting. So if we hit F8 there, Peter greater than Paul we can see is true. And what that's actually doing is comparing the ASCII values of the individual letters and then running through the letters until it hits an ASCII value which is greater or, or less. Um, in this case, E uh, it has a larger ASCII value than A 
and we get true and if we reverse that we should get false which we do cool you can also straight compare version numbers in terms of greater than oops we have 10 there but that's all right so we can just do f8 and now we get true for that we can also compare date objects and greater than will actually also pick out arrays and say what's in that array greater than the uh, end number so out of the array 7 8 9 we want what's greater than 8 which turns out to be 9 great stuff uh, now we see when I accidentally hit F10 uh, previously we tested that Peter should be greater than Paul and it absolutely is and we got a passed test underneath and uh, if we have a look at this one we have a failed test and it shows what the problem was there as well. Let's check that it works with the uh, version as we demonstrated above. That works too. So anything that works with the underlying PowerShell greater than comparator will work in PESTA in terms of the B greater than assertion. We'll double check with the date objects. Great, that works as well. Now, what about the greater than in the array? If we're just directly translating that, you know, what's the sign? Does it work the same way? Um, this probably isn't going to work, right? Because we're testing something different here. We're testing the result of the array. So that array is just getting piped to the should function. And then the should has got a parameter be greater than. So this shouldn't work. And it doesn't. Yeah. So I expected the actual value to be greater than eight, but got seven. The reason being is that it's taking the first item in that array, piping it to be greater than, and that item is seven. So it fails. If we wanted to do this, then probably this second test is the way we should put the greater than in front of it and say should be nine. Does that work? Absolutely, that does work. Great. Next one, be greater or equal. Um, again, uses the underlying PowerShell uh, operation operator to compare the two values. Two should be greater than zero. It is, brilliant. And two should be greater than or equal to two. It is, excellent. Fairly simple. Now, <clears throat> these first few uh, assertions are the ones that I tend to use the most. Be in slightly less, but it's always useful. So, be in asserts that the actual value is contained within the array or collection. So, B should be in the array ABC. It is. And 27 should be in the array of numbers 1 to 100. Again, excellent. Be less than. Now we're going to say that that's going to be very similar to greater than, so I'm not going to uh, go into this in, in too much detail. We're going to clear the uh, error count and say, well, error count is going to be less than. This is terrible actual PESTA code, right? Because you're setting something that you're then testing. Make sure that in your actual code, you don't set something that you then test. It's a pointless test. This is just to demonstrate the uh, less than operator. Good. Unsurprisingly, the stuff we just set uh, is correct. Be less or equal. Again, uses uh, PowerShell's LE operator to compare the two. One should be less than 10. 10 should be less than or equal to 10. Brilliant. Be like. Now, again, uses the underlying PowerShell like operator. We're setting uh, the value is an actual value string. So now we're using actual and wildcard. So note that uh, the A of actual is lowercase. Does this pass? Yes, it does. Because the like operator with PowerShell is case insensitive. So 
the PowerShell, the pester test follows that. And again, we've put a string that uh, doesn't match to test if that fails. It doesn't, uh, because I have put the not operator in there. So effectively, we're negating the test. So not actual is not like actual value, if you follow that logic. And uh, the test passed. Um, <clears throat> be like exactly. This is how you check a value in terms of it being case sensitive and uses C like underneath should be like exact exactly test will pass and it does because we've got actual and then a wildcard and then we're going to negate it here again just to demonstrate negate and so it shouldn't match we're negating it so the test should pass excellent it does now b of type I actually find this really useful to check that if you're getting a return of an object from a remote system, that it is the type of object that you expect because you want your function to be returning the correct type probably so you can pipe it into another function. Because if you're doing a passive test for each individual function in a module, for instance, then you're testing each function in isolation. You're not testing the fact that a function can pipe to another function. So this is why B of type is useful. So you're making sure that you're getting the correct type of object out the back so that it will pipe correctly into the next function. So um, let's just do a get item here and we can see that we got a file system info type there. So let's have a look at this. All right. This is because um, the top type is directory info. And now what we'll do is we'll see if this passes as well. Because the base type is the file system info. Can you check for base type as well? Yes, you can. So B of type will not only check the top, but it will check the tree up from the top in terms of uh, your object type. Um, this is again a negated failing test. So if this test passes, then it is not of the type. And that pass, and that test passes as well. Okay. Now there is something you can do. Um, I think from PowerShell 3 onwards, which is you can actually uh, set a custom type for an object. There's a few ways to do it. Um, the way I usually do it is using uh, PS type name equals whatever in a, in a custom object. Again, this is useful if you're making a custom object and you're wanting to pipe it from one function to another, you can actually set the parameters to, to that name. So I do this quite a lot. Um, can we use B of type to check for a custom type name? No. So it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, the reason being is because the type name of that custom object, when you ask it, is still a PS custom object. The test that B of type is, is uh, making under the hood is not testing for that custom type name. Um, what I do for this is um, look at the PS type name set item. Now, if you do this the way that I've done by um, putting the PS type name in the custom object, it will be the first item in that uh, list of PS type names, hence the uh, zero into the array. And then we're just checking with should be rather than be of type and checking those two strings match, which it does. Excellent. So that's how to test for a custom type name that you've put in uh, yourself. Um, let's have a look at should be true. Now, this doesn't use a standard operator under the hood. This actually uses the same logic as if. And 
the way in the docs of Pesta says it should be true or truthy. Now, if you have a look at what you can do with if, then a lot of things, you know, will will resolve to true or false. And it doesn't have to be the actual Boolean values. So one will resolve to two and zero will resolve to false and all that sort of stuff. If you want to know a bit more about that, uh, follow the link to the MSDN article that's uh, um, <coughs> linked here on T20, uh, which is Jeffrey Snover himself talking about if tests. So true or truthy? Um, true should be true. Now this definitely should pass, right? Great, it does. Uh, one should be true. I said before that in if one equates to true, that works too. Now what about an array? Now if again will take this, it will take anything that's non-zero and we'll call it true. Great. That's you can do some really useful things in if statements in your code, taking advantage of that. But it also works in pest tests. Um, we're going to try and get uh, a process. Obviously, code is uh, is VS Code, uh, the XE. So um, this should be true because it's got something there, and that passes as well. So that just illustrates you doesn't have to be true or one or whatever. Just anything will equate to true in the if statement. Now, do we really need this separate be true individual parameter to should? Well, sort of and sort of not, right? Because do we need it and should be true? We can actually fall back to that first assertion, just the dash be, and then compare it to the Boolean value true. That works just as well. Does one work just as well? That works just as well. Now, what about this array? Now, remember, this worked before and doesn't work now. I've said that will pass. It won't. It will fail. I'll edit that later. What about this get process? Well, that equated to a pass before, but once we've changed from the be true uh, to be then the boolean true again that fails so I think in most cases just be and then the boolean true will do but there are certain use cases where using this assertion be true is useful because it tests for that what the dots call a truthy rather than actual true so just something to bear in mind if you want to test something else. Um, be false, fairly obvious that this is going to be the same sort of thing. So false should be false. Yep, that passed. Zero should be false. Yep. Null. Yep, that is false. Um, and <clears throat> there is something that I want to say here. Um, we're trying to get a process that doesn't exist. Yeah. Now, should this be false? Effectively, it's going to have an error, right? Because this doesn't exist. What happens here? Well, that passes. So why does that pass? Yeah, it's because um, <clears throat> what's happening here is the it test is sticking the um, error into um, false and if an if will equate an error as a false statement so we can see that that test passes all right moving on to have count what this does is uses the uh, dot count method of the incoming objects to the pipeline so we've got an array of three numbers that should have the count of three. And it does. All right. Well, we'll set the now we'll set the uh, value to a string. Should have count one single string. OK. What about not variable? 
So again, there's nothing in this variable. We haven't set it. So presumably, it should have a count of zero, right? Well, it doesn't. OK, so what's happening here? Expected an empty collection, but got a collection with size 1. Is that because of an, it's picking up the error? Well, maybe. Um, I'm not quite sure what's happening here. And in fact, um, I'm not the only one, because there is a uh, pester issue uh, describing uh, this behavior. And you can look it up to see uh, if it's solved or not on that following link. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, if we compare it to 1, then it will pass. It's pretty strange. Um, if you want to get around this weird behavior, you can use measure object. So you can pipe an unset variable into measure object, and then using the count on that object, we'll actually get the expected behavior. So now we should think that that is 0, and it is 0. Again, we're not using have count here, notice we're using should be. So be a little careful about using this have count assertion because it's non intuitive uh, in certain cases that you're going to get the right answer. Should contain? Well, uses power cells, contains operator, and uh, this works exactly as you would expect in terms of it's looking for that value inside an array. Remember that contains is not looking inside a string, it's looking for the value inside the array. And we can see that uh, that works with 1 to 100 as well. Next one is should exist. Now, this uses a test path underneath, so I presume we're all pretty uh, familiar with test path. Test path. Um, we're just going to get um, a path inside the uh, actual variable. Does it exist? Absolutely, absolutely it does. Um, if you've got wildcards um, in, or wildcard characters in there, then um, that's not going to work. Um, there is a way uh, inside Pesta to uh, make sure you're not taking account of those, but I don't generally use that. What I prefer to you is the actual test path and again dropping back to should be. Now you'll notice that I've said that a few times that there's maybe a slight weirdness or something that, that's maybe slightly inconsistent or non-intuitive at least in some of the more esoteric um, assertions. And I've said drop back to should be for every one of these. Should be is your main workhorse. workhorse. Uh, so let's see. OK, that's perfect. So now we're using literal path. Um, be null or empty. Well, be null or empty is really useful. Yeah, particularly when used with uh, not. And, and that uses the, the dot net method is null or empty. So let's have a look at that. Null, obviously, pipe that into should, then be null or empty. Yes, it is. Empty array, empty string, excellent. Although I've shown them all uh, non-negated there, that null or empty is super useful with the not. Yeah. Great for you know some really basic testing as you're development developing. Uh, next, let's look at should throw. Now, the thing you should remember about this is before the pipeline, this needs to be a script block. It's the only assertion where you need to have a script block, but it is the case for this. Now, foo on its own, because what is that? Uh, should throw an error because you can't execute it. Um, this should fail because that's a perfectly valid script block. And bear in mind though, because you're essentially going to be used this for testing, okay, I've passed invalid information to my function parameters. 
and I should be throwing an error to say, sorry, this is invalid because of X, Y, Z. You want to make sure that you're testing for the correct error because anything you throw an error, it could be, could be just a problem in another part of your code that's throwing an error rather than the error you're testing for. So I always like with the throw is to include the string that uh, is part of the error to make sure that you're testing the right thing. So now I am great that that passes. That test, that string, is actually using a, a substring match. Um, so we can see that we're throwing foo bar baz, and now we're only testing for part part of it. So bar. So this, this is useful, right? Because you don't have to have the entire exact error message. You can just put a couple of keywords in there and you're good to go. And we can see that that pass is fine. Um, talking about we're going to be it test just catch any exception, right? Because that's what happens. Effectively, if the assertion fails, it throws an exception and you get a failed test. So should not throw it's pretty redundant right because if anything throws the test will fail now I don't usually use this uh, when I've fully constructed my function and my pass the test I do use it if I've only got I'm just starting developing the function maybe my planning isn't brilliant and I don't really know what the functions actually going to look like what the parameters are going to look like I just use it just to set up a basic skeleton run some pest tests at like have I mucked it up in some basic way once the function takes shape I'll use some proper pest tests um, so should not throw eh, maybe use it maybe don't it's up to you all right that is the end of the normal Pester assertions that I use um, should be greater than, less than, and uh, throw and null or empty are kind of like the main ones I use. Um, I tend to stay away from uh, be false, be true, and have count just because of the maybe the slightly unexpected behaviours. Um, the rest of these assertions are all to do with regular expressions. If regular expressions aren't your bag then that's fine. You can probably uh, switch off now. But if you know what you're doing with uh, with regex, then you'll follow this perfectly fine. I'm not going to explain regex uh, as part of the rest of this. Um, but um, if you do want to learn about it, there's loads of stuff on the net about it. Um, match uses the match operator. And we can see that's fine. And we see that these don't match so that should fail good um, <clears throat> if you look at the pest docs there is the following tip which is attached to pretty much all of the regular expressions um, uh, assertions in the wiki um, oh on that if you look at the wiki it may look like I've just copied and pasted all of uh, the wiki tests and I kind of have um, but also, I thought of some more, and I contributed back to the wiki, and now they've got some of the extra tests I thought of. Uh, and you can contribute to the wiki as well, if you wish. Um, I don't like this, because it says, if, well, if you want to match two strings exactly, yeah, they should match, and then use the regex escape method, and then the actual string. Yeah? So, that one passes and the reason being is that the dot is uh, f um, in in regex terms is match any character so that dot matches the capital G of Greg um, and then in this tip they've said well let's escape it so the dot really means dot and now it fails well that seems a whole lot of rigmarole to me. Again, you can fall back to should be. Makes it much simpler for the person reading your code, much simpler for you as well. And now we can see that that also fails in the correct way. So I'm not 
particularly keen on that tip. I'm sure there are cases where it's very useful. Um, right now, I can't think of any, though. Um, hence why I didn't want to take it out of the uh, out of the wiki, because I'm sure there is a use case for that. Much exactly, exactly the same as the above, but this time with uh, case sensitivity. So I use C match under the hood, and we can see that capital I uh, matches the capital I in the uh, string. And then we've got a capital A, and that should fail, which it does. Um, again, although I don't mind matching much exactly, it isn't particularly different to do this. And you know, I am value match I am, um, and then should be true. Depends on what you want to do. I'd probably do this. I just find it easier to read, so people don't need to know what match exactly means and they don't need to know it uses C match under the hood and, and that sort of thing. You can do other things that um, that make sure that uh, it's kind of more readable to people who don't know PESTA as well as you do. <clears throat> so we can see that that passes just fine. Um, these are more interesting because these will look inside a file to check and see whether the regex matches. Um, so I'm just setting the content of a file. Don't worry about the fact that uh, that path says test drive. That's part of PESTA. We'll go into that uh, in more detail in a later episode. And now we'll have a look to see if um, that uh, content will regex match to I am. And it does great. And now we've got a slightly more complicated regular expression. Still fairly simple, but slightly more complicated. And we can see that that matches as well. And we can see one that doesn't. Um, file content match exactly. Well, as you can probably tell from the previous ones, match exactly uses C match instead of match. So again, um, um, case sensitive. Uh, if you want to use uh, regex, uh, I use Regex 101 to help me out with constructing regular expressions. There's a whole lot of websites out, out there to help, but I just thought I'd stick that in as, if you wanted to use that. Uh, match exactly. It's always a couple of demonstrators, uh, demonstrations of match exactly that works. And again, we've got a capital A there. That should fail. All right. Next one. So this is file content match multiline. Again, uses match underneath the hood. And we'll just uh, do that so we can read um, all the text. Um, this will read the file as a single string. So obviously, get content when you've got a multi-line file. We'll read all of the uh, contents of that file, and we'll do you uh, an array of strings. This will take that file and do you as a single string. Um, under the hood, it actually uses this um, get content actual value delimiter car zero, um, which is kind of an odd way of doing it. But you've got to remember that uh, Pesta unbelievably uh, still supports uh, PowerShell 2.0, and get content raw was only introduced in, in PowerShell 3. I have got the utmost respect in getting Pesta to support PowerShell 2.0. Um, I would be unimpressed. Uh, if somebody tried to make me develop anything in uh, 2.0, uh, and I would probably refuse. Um, just uh, a thing, if you're using the caret and the dollar to represent the beginning and the end of uh, a whole file, um, uh, sorry, this that will represent the beginning and the end of the whole file rather than the uh, beginning and end of a line. So, line one and line two, set content, Add content. So now we have a file with two lines. What are we looking for here? Should file content match multi-line? And <coughs> we're looking at um, does that regular expression match? Yes, it does. And now that doesn't match as you would expect. Although I put pass there uh, rather than uh, fail. OK. Now, this has been a very long episode. Um, I hope you found it useful. 
Remember, there is the uh, Pesto Wiki as well. Play around with all the ones you wish. Um, these are all the assertions. There's actually a way of putting your own assertions in, um, but perhaps that's a, a bit uh, advanced. We may do that at the very end if we uh, if we if we uh, if we want to of the series. Well, thanks for sticking around for the whole um, whole time of this lengthy episode. And if you enjoyed this one, then please hit the like button. And if you want to see more, then hit the subscribe subscribe button. Thank you very much.